Halo, cek, cek. Halo.
Yeah, so um, let's begin the session. So good evening and a very warm welcome to one and all. So Dr. Agarwal Grand Rounds. So today our topic of discussion is interpretation of corneal topography. So we all know that corneal topography is the most commonly performed non-invasive imaging technique for studying the shape and structure and the details of the cornea. So the colorful scans gives us a lot of details about the cornea, which needs to be interpreted in the right way so that we pick up the corneal pathologies at the early stage. And also it helps in better treatment planning, particularly in cases of refractive surgeries and also in keratoconus. So today we have amazing ophthalmologists on board who would be discussing about the same. Uh, firstly, I would like to invite our speaker, Dr. Bradley Randleman. Welcome to Dr. Agarwal's Grand Round, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, sir. Uh, so Dr. Brad Randleman is currently working as a professor of ophthalmology and the head of cornea and refractive services at the Cole Eye Institute, Cleveland. And his special interests are mainly in corneal ectatic diseases, particularly in post-LASIK ectasia and in keratoconus. And we all have read about the Randleman ectasia scoring system, and we have used it extensively for detecting the risk in case of a post-LASIK ectasia. So today we have this wonderful opportunity of interacting with Dr. Randleman himself. Uh, we are very pleased to have you with us, sir. We are eager to hear from you. Thank you very much. So I would also like to invite our panelist, Dr. Susan Ma'am, who is the Director of uh, Cornea and Refractive Foundation at Dr. Agarwal's Eye Institute. Uh, welcome, ma'am. And I would like to invite Dr. Kumar Doctor, who is the Chief Medical Director of Dr. Eye Institute in Mumbai, and he has done extensive work in uh, cataract and refractive surgeries. So a warm welcome to one and all and to all the online viewers out there. And for the online viewers, if you have got any queries or comments, please do drop it in the chat box below. So we would be addressing the same at the end of the session. So without much of a delay, we would like to begin this session. I would like to request Dr. Brad to begin with the presentation. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much again for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'll be talking about interpretation of corneal topography. I have no financial disclosures. Uh, however, we do have early 2021, we have a new textbook coming out. I'm uh, very excited about this. Worked with uh, Marconi Santiago and my partner here, uh, BJ Dupes. Uh, many of the images you'll see today uh, come from this atlas. So start off with uh, four cases, just going to introduce these now and we'll circle back later and thinking about it, is this a good candidate for LASIK? What about this patient is patient number two, patient number three, and then patient number four. So we're going to circle back to these toward the end of the talk. I'd like to talk about setting yourself up for success, about suspicious pattern recognition, the role of epithelial thickness mapping and how I use it today, and then putting it all together with some case reviews. There are so many different technologies available. Most of you have one, and probably many of you have more than one of these devices available in your office today. Um, and, th and they're all wonderful devices. They all have uh, many strong points. They also all have some deficiencies, and so that's why most of us use more than one at a time. When I say setting yourself up for success, I mean setting up your devices in a way that they give you the maximal information and also, uh, probably most importantly, make sure that you know uh, the output of your own machine and make sure that, you, that it's reproducible and consistent. It's, uh, th this is a, a screenshot from the Pentacam just showing you all the different ways that the basic format refractive map can be displayed. So it's important to know what to do and, and also important if someone has changed one of your settings to realize that the information is going to look very different. This is a Placido uh, topography image, the exact same eye, this is the exact same image shown in two different color steps. So the first thing we can adjust is color step. A color step is the amount of change needed 
to be demonstrated or shown by a different color on the map. So on your left, you see uh, this cornea is shown in 1.5 diopter color steps, meaning that any change less than 1.5 diopters will not have a different color uh, to it. Whereas the image on uh, your right is in 0 0.5 diopter color steps. Now you see a little focal inferior steepening that you did not see otherwise because the color steps were set. This is a composite image, same concept. This is the exact same eye, the exact same image. In the upper left, it's shown in quarter diopter color steps in the bottom right, 1.5 diopter. And you can see how the information displayed really looks significantly different. The 0 0.5, uh, excuse me, the 2.25 color step looks pretty abnormal here, whereas the 1.5 looks very smooth and regular. I recommend 0 0.5 diopter color steps for refractive surgery evaluations. I think it's a good balance between noise and detail. I think if you're only doing uh, cataract or keratoconus work, you could argue that a 1.0 diopter scale is, is reasonable as well. I think the quarter diopter scale is a little too noisy for most people to review. And at 1.5 diopters, unfortunately, I think we lose a little bit too much data for that to be optimal. This is a study I was a participant in uh, a few years ago. The primary focus of the study was looking at the variability between uh, individual reviewers in terms of how they subjectively classified maps. Uh, but we did a second analysis in that study um, looking at having the same reviewers review information twice. When the maps were first sent out, uh, they were all sent out in 1.5 diopter color scales. And so I actually, as, as one of the reviewers requested that the information also be sent out in 0 0.5 diopter color scales. So this is the same eye, same exact scan, but in different color scales. Interestingly, most of the reviewers, when they looked at this image in a masked fashion in 1.5 diopter color scales, most of the reviewers uh, thought this was either normal or mildly suspicious. Whereas when they looked at it in 0 0.5 diopter color steps, the vast majority thought this was an abnormal scan. And this is a patient who developed ectasia after LASIK. It was an abnormal scan. So just looking at these maps, you can see with a symmetric pattern, uh, there is difference in the detail, but not so much in the pattern. However, when you have focal steepening, uh, the information transmitted here is significantly different. Again, this image we saw in real time, uh, how the same individual scored this differently just based on the scale that it was. Uh, so the next thing to look at is your color scales. And what I mean by color scales are well, whether this is an absolute scale, a fixed scale, or a relative scale. And every one of your devices is going to have that listed, both in terms of what the colors represent, that's really the color steps, but also the scale that's being used. A relative scale is going to adjust the colors used to the cornea it's evaluating. It's going to try to normalize that and then show you patterns within that. Whereas a fixed scale uh, is going to have certain colors always mean the same thing. So red is always going to be 46 diopters or 47 diopters, depending on the setting. So looking at this, uh, this is an image from the same individual 10 years apart. And on first glance, it looks like there's been some significant progression in steepening. The upper images are showing all greens, light greens, whereas the bottom images are showing the red colors that we're all uh, innately trained to look for. However, one of these was done in relative scale, the other one in fixed scale. And if you look at the uh, keratometry data, there's actually been no change at all over 10 years. It simply looks different because of the scale. This is the exact same eye, same patient, imaged on the same day on two different devices. The Scheinflug device, which gives you Scheinflug uh, derived curvature, shown in the relative uh, map on the far left, shown in fixed, uh, the fixed scale in the middle. And you can see that detail of focal steepening that you really couldn't see uh, in the relative map. And then on the far right, the 
uh, the placido image from the same eye where you can really see that focal steepening. So set up your maps in a way that you can get the, map, the, the best data. Um, I always recommend fixed scales for baseline evaluations because you really want to know when you look at that, when you see reds or yellows or blues, you want to innately be able to know what the shape of that cornea is because we as humans are pattern recognition animals. And so if you don't do that, you're going to miss some things. So when do you adjust the color scales? Well, I do recommend uh, in corneas that are way too steep or way too flat and they've exceeded your color scales, if you need finer detail from those, then it's reasonable to do that. So you can see this is a patient with advanced keratoconus. And yes, you can see that it's generally steep, but you cannot see anywhere in particular where it is steep. Uh, but if you look at the finer details, you can see uh, a more focal steepening pattern. Just like, uh, and that's my assistant, if you could hear that in the background, my little two-year-old assistant here. So. In the, uh, in the same direction, uh, in a cornea that is too flat, uh, say after RK or after uh, high treatment with LASIK or PRK, if you need finer details there, you can adjust to a relative pattern. Again, this is the same map showing you uh, more detail in the relative maps. And in this particular case, for instance, you can see uh, a particular focal flattening this was a patient with RK. So you can see a focal flattening around an incision that was not visible in terms of uh, being able to detect that focal change in curvature in a fixed scale. So there are times when I use relative scales, but as a baseline, I do not. Uh, so when you're looking at curvature, it's important first to identify the color step scale, and then, uh, so the steps and the scale, and then look at the quality of the scan. Do you have good coverage? Is the scan well-centered? Is there any artifactual data loss? Go through all of those steps first before you try to identify any patterns because if you don't have that information, then you're really not going to come to a good conclusion for pattern recognition. So moving on to suspicions patterns that we should recognize. This is a composite placido image showing you various stages of asymmetry. So the images on the top are going from a very normal round image uh, to a, uh, a, a uh, regular uh, bow tie type of pattern to a bit of asymmetric bow tie with a bit of inferior steepening. All of the images on the bottom are abnormal because of their focal steepening and asymmetry. Uh, one of the things to really identify is this asymmetric bow tie pattern. And an asymmetric bow tie pattern is not necessarily pathologic. It's something that should warrant some attention, but frequently it's not uh, necessarily uh, a contraindication for laser vision correction. But the asymmetric bow tie with a skewed radial axis, so as you can see here, the axis is skewed as well as the relative weight of steepening. So that's an asymmetric bow tie with a skewed radial axis, and that pattern is definitively abnormal. Uh, and really should be uh, immediately identified. Against the rule steepening patterns are, are not necessarily abnormal, but they are atypical in young patients and they really warrant further evaluation. If you look at the image on the left, it looks relatively symmetric in its uh, appearance, although there is some additional inferior steepening that you start to see. Whereas the image on the right, although the overall cornea is not particularly steep, the inferior portion of the cornea is significantly steeper. You can see that sort of teardrop with the blue uh, below the midline. That is uh, typical of the sort of pellucid type of pattern. Uh, and those things are, are really patterns that should jump out at you. This is another, uh, another patient where the right eye looks like a fairly symmetric against the rule of stigmatism pattern. The left eye is starting to have asymmetry because there's a skewed axis and over time you can see this actually this inferior steepening component increased. Another patient with asymmetric keratoconus but you can see that against the rule pattern in both eyes in the in the clinically manifest eye it's easy to detect this is the uh, the steep meridian identified by the device, but you can see really this is the focal steepening area. So this is a, a dramatically skewed axis with inferior steepening in, these, in this eye. 
when you use this eye to evaluate the other eye, if this were the worst eye, an, on initial view, you might say, well, this is just uh, sort of an a, uh, against the rule pattern, but no real asymmetry. But if you look, there is asymmetry in this cornea in, in every map, both the curvature map, the elevation maps, and to a, a small extent, the thickness map. The inferior temporal portion of this cornea uh, is more warped uh, and uh, more sticking forward, if you will. And so that's a marker of abnormality. Uh, again, in the less affected eye, if this were the worst affected eye, it might be harder to identify. Another pattern to be aware of is the horizontally steep pattern. Both of these eyes on initial evaluation might look like relatively symmetric with the rule patterns. But if you look further, you can see that uh, this is what's been described as a vertical D pattern where the steepening is really in the horizontal meridian. Uh, it's a little bit less common. It's also easier to miss. So again, if you look at the format view from the Scheinflug device, you can see that the maximal area of asymmetry is in the horizontal meridian here, but it is quite asymmetric. And this is certainly an eye that you would not want to operate on. This is a composite image showing various degrees of this D pattern, or, or what I call here a drooping D pattern, where it's, it's really a little bit more um, inferior uh, temporal or inferior nasally uh, displaced depending on the eye. Again, all of these are patterns that you want to be able to identify. One of the more challenging patterns to identify is what's called a truncated bow tie. So on the left, you have a full bow tie, a regular astigmatism pattern. On the right, you have a truncated bow tie. And you can see the difference when you look in the steep meridian in both eyes, you can see that the difference between the center and the periphery in a symmetric or regular bow tie pattern is not dramatic. whereas in the truncated pattern, the area of steepening drops off dramatically and very quickly. This is basically a central cone, and so the asymmetry that we're accustomed to is not as easy to see because it's focally right in the center. So that does, on initial glance, that looks like a symmetric pattern because in some ways it is, but it's really truly just a focally steep pattern. And so again, in the more involved eye, you can see this focal steepness centrally with central thinning and with an abrupt focal elevation on anterior and posterior surface. This is the dual shine fluid Placido Galilei device. In the less affected eye in this patient, you can see a much milder truncated bow tie pattern, but again, this is something that should catch your attention. Uh, in this eye, the elevation data and the thickness data is not uh, as uh, remarkable because this is essentially a subclinical uh, cone, but again, something you would definitely want to be able to identify in refractive screening. And this is another patient, and again, in this eye, the, the truncated bow tie is a little bit harder to perfectly identify, but if you, uh, one thing that I tend to use in these situations is the, uh, that dotted line centrally, and you can see that's where the machine has identified the pupil. If you, the majority of the steepening that you see is within the pupil, and as you look in the same meridian, you see that it drops off fairly quickly, uh, that to me is a, a marker of uh, either abnormality or at least a, a flag that gets my attention. And again, in this particular eye, while the specific steepening is not as dramatic, you see that it is accompanied with a fairly remarkable anterior, focal anterior elevation and focal, focal posterior elevation and also a displaced thinnest point. So this is concerning to me, uh, whereas on the very first glance, uh, you may miss it. Another thing to consider is that uh, keratoconus or the ectatic corneal disorders are really warpage diseases. And while many patients have very steep corneas, they don't have to have steep corneas in order to have an ectatic disease. So um, this is a patient who was misidentified as not having keratoconus, because someone said, well, their corneas are not particularly steep, they couldn't have keratoconus. But if you just look at the patterns, you can see it's clear they have focal steepening here and they have asymmetry between the eyes. So this is definitely a patient with early keratoconus, 
don't be fooled by the uh, keratometry metrics. Switching gears just a little bit, um, one of the technologies I'm using today uh, really all the time is uh, epithelial thickness mapping. And, and I really think that this is the, uh, the next level to help us screen patients, particularly for refractive surgery, but also following them for keratoconus. Uh, even though this is relatively new clinically in terms of being widely available, uh, particularly in the United States, uh, the research on this has been going on for decades. Dan Reinstein really has pioneered much of this, uh, particularly for keratoconus and for refractive surgery evaluations, using the very high frequency digital ultrasound. This device is available now in the United States. It's available world, worldwide. It is a little bit more cumbersome to use because it requires uh, a water bath and uh, the eye to be submerged in this uh, for evaluations. Um, uh, but Dan Reinstein has really described the patterns that you see, the variability in normal eyes, the focal thinning uh, at the corresponding to maximal steepening in ectatic disorders. And what you see later on in these eyes is you'll see focal steepening with compensatory hypertrophy around that. All of that is the epithelium's attempt to minimize uh, a change in curvature. David Wong and his group have. Uh, really pioneered the work using anterior segment OCT. And, and this is really what I, I think has brought epithelial thickness mapping to the forefront. Very high frequency digital ultrasound is slightly more accurate, but more difficult to use. Whereas most people have OCTs in their offices, uh, these are simply um, add on pieces to be able to do the anterior segment imaging. And so Again, this work has been around for many years. We did a study many years ago before the automated maps were done, looking at the regional change in, in epithelial thickness between ectatic eyes and normal eyes. This is a composite image of the, uh, of the uh, OptiView system. This was the RT view device with six millimeters of coverage. Uh, the Avanti now has nine millimeters of coverage. The Zeiss Cirrus device also is available in the US. Outside of the US, there are many other devices that I'm simply not familiar with, but there are many different OCTs that can do this now. So you can see this composite image looking at uh, the difference in epithelial maps. The upper left image is a normal eye. So there's always going to be a little variability across that. But as you start to see more focal uh, thinning patterns, Initially, what you'll see with uh, cones is a focal thinning, and then over time, you'll see focal thinning with compensatory hypertrophy. So the bottom right image shows a more advanced cone where there's focal thinning, but there's also hypertrophy around that. That's, that's sort of the donut pattern that Dan Reinstein described, uh, and, and that's really pathognomonic. Now, for refractive surgery, we're going to be looking at earlier, more subtle findings. So this is uh, the curvature map from Placido combined with the, uh, the uh, OCT total thickness in the middle and epithelial thickness on the far right. And you can see in that focal steepening, while the total thickness is reduced centrally, that might or might not get your attention because many of the patients who come in to see us have slightly thinner corneas. Whereas when you look at the epithelial map, you'll see that focal thinning with the hypertrophy around. That's again, really pathognomonic for uh, an ectatic disease. In milder cases, you're going to see subtler findings, but again, this, this focal thinning uh, that is coincidence with steepening is really uh, something that should catch your attention. This is a patient with ectasia after LASIK, and just to show the remarkable ability of the epithelium to remodel, look how thick the epithelium is in the regions where the cornea is flattest, compared to how thin it is in the region where the cornea is steepest. Uh, this is a, an image from Dan Reinstein showing what the epithelial maps look like with, in an eye with focal steepening that you can see on the curvature map, what they look like with the very high frequency digital ultrasound and the OCT. So they're very similar patterns. They're not perfectly analogous, but, but very similar in terms of the patterns. We published a paper last year going through sort of a review article of the, the different ways that 
you can use uh, regional epithelial thickness measurements in corneal evaluations, mostly for refractive screening and for ectasias, but in some other situations as well. So this is in survey of ophthalmology. You can also, uh, so when we're using this in screening, I think most people initially think that we're going to be screening out more eyes away from surgery. And certainly we do want to do that for anyone uh, who we're concerned may not be a good candidate. Uh, but what we've found is that we're probably screening more patients in than we are screening out. So we have these patients with focal inferior steepening, but really no other findings on shine fluke tomography, for instance, uh, and if these uh, focal steepening cases, if they look like they're coming from epithelial changes, then again, this is someone, this is a map who I operate, uh, offered surgery to uh, years ago. This is another patient uh, who had really the only suspicious finding was focal steepening, but there was, uh, there was also focal epithelial hypertrophy. And so this is another patient who I operated on. On the other hand, this is a patient with relatively mild focal steepening. There were some other suspicious findings on shine fluke tomography in terms of elevation and thickness, uh, but there was also a focal uh, thinning of the epithelium coincident with this focal steepening. So this is a patient who I declined surgery. Another patient with a pseudo-pellucid type of pattern, uh, but again, looks to be completely caused by epithelial remodeling. Another patient with a, a pseudo-pellucid type of pattern, but in this case, uh, and again, there were some other findings on shine fluke that were suspicious in this case, but there was also focal thinning in the region where the cornea was maximally steep. Now, this was an older map that only went to six millimeters in coverage for the epithelium. This is where the newer maps that go to nine millimeters are particularly helpful for these more peripheral steepening cases. So if we put all these things together, I want to go back to our four cases. I'd like to briefly present them, and then we'll show in a little bit greater detail. So the first patient is a 30-year-old male presenting for refractive surgery evaluation. This is not their first evaluation. They were told they were a candidate elsewhere. Has a moderate, moderate myope with relatively high astigmatism. Um, again, this is the uh, four-map refractive map for the right eye and the left eye. This is the enhanced ectasia map. None of the indices uh, light up in any of these uh, maps for either eye. Have a second 30-year-old patient, uh, same situation, a moderate myope, lower astigmatism in this case. Again, this is the right eye, four-map refractive map. This is the left eye, and these are the enhanced ectasia map. So the major metrics are really not showing anything. The D score is slightly elevated here. Uh, much more so in the right eye than the left eye. I have a 33-year-old male who presents for refractive surgery, uh, slightly lower myopia, slightly lower astigmatism. Uh, this is the four-map refractive map of the right eye and the left eye. Similar findings in the enhanced ectasia maps where uh, really no uh, abnormalities in either eye noted. And then finally, 32-year-old uh, female who was also told they were candidate elsewhere, a higher myope with higher degrees of astigmatism in both eyes. This is the format for the right eye and the left eye. Uh, the uh, enhanced dictation map, now the total D score is elevated and marked as suspicious in both eyes. So let's go back and look at these for a moment. And again, it's more difficult without uh, the live audience and the interaction. Um, my guess is that most people um, would consider this to be relatively unremarkable um, on first glance. But what I did in this case was I showed you the anterior curvature map in relative curvature. And this is the map in fixed curvature. And I think while all of the other maps look the same in terms of the elevation maps and the thickness map, in this eye, I hope you can really see that focal steepening uh, that is particularly uh, localized and therefore asymmetric, uh, slightly inferior to center in that right eye. Same thing, this is the left eye in relative curvature, this is the left eye in fixed curvature. A less abrupt pattern, but there is asymmetry there. There's between eye asymmetry, and there's also a skewed axis in this eye. This patient developed ectasia after LASIK, 
And when you look at the other maps, other than anterior curvature, there's nothing that really jumps out. And the, uh, certainly we showed the enhanced ectasia map. There was nothing there that, that jumped out. But really nothing looks uh, particularly remarkable in thickness or in elevation. But when you look at, for instance, in tangential curvature, you can really see that focal steepening. Some of the uh, asymmetry indices looked abnormal in this eye. So again, this is an eye that could be detected uh, as abnormal, but really the anterior surface was where the information lies and very difficult to identify in relative curvature. So now that you know what I've done with these, I'll show you this second patient again. Same type of situation. In this eye in the relative map, you can see some inferior steepening, but I think it's much clearer in this fixed map. And you see the inferior steepening that corresponds to an inferior focal elevation on both anterior and posterior surface. Now, interestingly, even though there was this uh, focal steepening in both eyes, more remarkable in one, and changes in the elevation, as you saw, the enhanced dictation map did really not uh, particularly help you make this decision. Another patient who unfortunately developed dictation after LASIK. Uh, finally, we have, uh, or, or sorry, a 33-year-old male who has uh, the moderate myopia. This was not um, a relative scale. This was a fixed curvature. And so you can see that focal inferior steepening in this eye, but you really don't see any corresponding changes in anterior surface elevation uh, or uh, anterior or posterior or in the thickness map in either eye. But there is slight fo focal steepening up to a diopter in both eyes. Uh, again, uh, the enhanced ectasia maps uh, were unremarkable. In this case, the patient had focal epithelial steepening in both eyes. So this patient was actually offered refractive surgery uh, because they were deemed to be a candidate because their steepening was from uh, epithelial hypertrophy. Sorry. Um, had some technical difficulty there. So the final patient um, is this higher myope with higher degrees of cylinder. Now in this patient, the enhanced ectasia map did look uh, borderline suspicious in both eyes. This patient had a focal against the rule pattern with some inferior uh, elevation changes in anterior and posterior. Uh, so let's see what the epithelial maps show. In this eye, um, you can see focal thinning centrally, even though the total thickness is not particularly low, the pattern has focal thinning with compensatory hypertrophy around it. And so this patient, again, a all combination of all the different things we're looking at really had uh, an, a an atypical eye and one that uh, we declined laser vision correction. So in summary, Set up yourself and your device for success. Make sure that you set it up correctly and make sure you know how you have things set up. Be able to recognize suspicious patterns. Utilize epithelial thickness mapping. If you have an OCT in your practice, you almost certainly have the ability to get an add-on to be able to look at epithelial thickness uh, for not much money, and I highly recommend that. And again, use all the data available to you. Don't rely simply on metrics. I had someone send a case to me uh, to ask my opinion last week, uh, and all they sent me were the basic information from the patient, and they sent me the enhanced dictation maps. They didn't send me the four maps. It's fine to use metrics, but don't rely specifically on them. Use all the data available to you. And with that, I'll conclude so we can answer some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bright. It was a wonderful presentation, very well covered. So we would take up some questions now. Uh, firstly, I would like to ask, uh, what would be the minimum and the maximum keratometry cutoff that you would consider for your refractive surgery patients? I would like to hear this from all our panelists as well, uh, starting with Dr. Bright. Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's an extremely hard question to start off with. Um, so 
there is, so if you are looking at steep corneas for hyperopic corrections, there is some reasonable data available that there is such a thing as being too steep. Um, you generally, the, the old sort of um, anecdote was you don't want to steepen a cornea more than 50 diopters. Um, and that's probably true, but probably you don't want to steepen a cornea more than about four diopters, particularly if they're at 44 or 45 diopters to begin with. So for hyperopic corrections, I'm looking at both the baseline keratometry values and how much steepening uh, I will do. In terms of data surrounding or, or for myopic corrections, there's very limited data that there is such a thing as too flat. Uh, 35 diopters has been listed as the cutoff. I don't think there's any real good science that shows that, but I do think that if you get um, into the 31, 32 diopter range, you may start to have some difficulty with visual quality. So I don't have a hard and fast inferior or, or sorry, flattening amount, but I do, I do start to get cautious when, if and when we're going to get down into the 32 or 33 diopter range. And that's very difficult to do. That generally requires a high treatment and a fairly flat cornea to begin with. And there aren't very many of those folks. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to comment on this? Anything to add? Yeah, I think, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I think Brad has uh, said most of the points uh, with relation to flat uh, corneas. Uh, when you go to the steeper side, uh, when you go above, uh, you know, for some point two, you do need to open up your eyes and start looking at the maps really carefully. And not just that, I would say even earlier, because uh, uh, as Brad said, it's uh, there are a lot of things that you have to analyze. It's not just one parameter that you look at. There are a lot of things. So if you have a high astigmatism, just a pure astigmatism, sometimes you may have steeper values. Uh, so look at all the parameters. Uh, epithelial maps, if you have them, are great. Uh, somebody asked a question about the Kleismeda uh, indices, and uh, uh, a lot of centers, especially I know in our uh, branches, which are the referral, which are basically the ones who refer, they uh, send the uh, patient based on the Kleismeda index. But what I'd like to say is, you also end up missing a lot of patients just based on that alone. So that's that basically covers the anterior surface, the anterior uh, you know part of the cornea alone. It doesn't cover the pachymetry, the posterior surface, or anything. And that's where uh, uh, keratoconus actually starts up early, the posterior surface. So to answer that, uh, do not, uh, of course, if you have a, a suspicious Kleismeda, you always refer, but that's not the only criteria. Look at the cylinder, look at the axis of astigmatism, look at uh, so many other factors, look at the cornea as such clinically, look at whether the patient has eye rubbing, look at the, whether the patient uh, has is having frequent change of glasses. And this is also all, all in relation to the question that you asked, Sanjana, whether it's just that one value that you look at. That's not how it goes. So you look at all these clinical parameters together and then decide about whether you want to refer the patient further for further pentacam screening. And without a proper screening of all the surfaces, the pachymetry, elevation data, uh, I don't think you can actually go ahead and decide take a refractive decision based on just the Kleismeda index alone. No, by the time those are abnormal, you, you, you're, you're exactly right. You've missed quite a few, I'd say, by the, if you're waiting for that to look specifically abnormal. And, and on the other hand, you'll see some um, abnormals that maybe truly aren't. So... Again, helpful, but not not absolute. Uh, can I make some comments, please? Hi, Susan and everyone. Brad, uh, excellent presentation as usual. I just want to make some observations. One is I love your uh, gallery. So your photography is oh. as, as brilliant as your work. So congratulations on that. Uh, have, you you seen, uh, have you seen anything like an inverse keratoconus? So we normally see an inferior steepening exactly the other way around. Have you seen anything like that? And uh, I mean, you have, you know, we have seen a lot of epithelial mapping. We do a lot of that today. But, uh, you know, patients who have regression, uh, have you seen them with epithelial mapping? So one question here is, uh, we are now talking epithelial mapping. And I don't want to take home message that, you know, the regression, ectasia, epithelial mapping is the way to go. Because we have not talked at all about biomechanics. So all these three patients or four patients that you showed and we looked at the epithelial thickness and you rejected the patient purely on epithelial thickness and not looking at biomechanics at all is what my question would be. And another thing I've seen sometimes on a pentacam, if the pack is 630, okay, so abnormally thick, 
you will still get a steepening on the posterior surface of the cornea and all the other indices and everything will be perfectly normal so question 1 would be that have you seen a inverse keratoconus have you seen abnormally thick corneas with steepening on the posterior surface and all the other indices normal and do we look only at the epithelium uh, to reject a case in one of the cases that you did where you rejected lasik and saw the thinning of the uh, epithelium so i i just want to clarify those points sure um by inverse keratoconus do you mean like a superior steepening pattern yes now uh, yes i have seen i think one <laughs> and so um and at many meetings we have sort of batted around this I, so yes i think it exists uh but i think it is extremely uncommon i haven't seen i i certainly have not seen five cases that i really suspected were keratoconus in my career that were superior steepening so yes i think it exists i think it is quite rare um in terms of the epithelial mapping uh and i'm glad you asked this so that i can can clarify this i i certainly don't mean to imply that i'm only using the epithelial mapping i'm using it as one additional piece um but what i've found is there are a lot of cases where for instance if you use the four map view on and and many of the shine flukes sort of have that so if you look at curvature if you look at thickness if you look at anterior elevation posterior elevation and then if you consider some of the metrics they provide you have a <clears throat> you have a lot of cases where those things don't always agree so one or two of those maps will look suspicious one or two of them will look pretty normal so i'm using the epithelial map in addition i'm adding it to that um but uh and, and again different people are using it differently so i'm using it additively but if i see a couple of things that look abnormal and the epithelial map looks abnormal then i tend to be rejecting those patients and the converse is true if i see really only changes in the anterior surface and i see focal focal thickening in the epithelial map then i tend to think those are okay um in terms of biomechanics <clears throat> i would prefer to use corneal biomechanics for screening I mean, that's what my research in my lab is is based on um, but i don't think that today we have very good biomechanic measurements clinically uh, the best we have is total eye biomechanics and uh, unfortunately i don't think they are particularly accurate i think you can use them adjunctively as well uh, but i have not seen any good data that wants me uh, that makes me want to use that preferentially to the other things we have but i totally agree hopefully someday that's exactly where we will go in terms of the last uh, question so i'll i'll answer it i guess slightly differently i've seen patients with thick corneas who definitely have ectatic disease um i'm not sure if i can recall specifically seeing a thick cornea with only a posterior elevation and nothing else um I, i'm sure it exists again i tend to look at the posterior um information after the anterior information not because it's not uh not because the surface is necessarily not a good place to look but because the way that the machines capture that data i i think is still a little limited in terms of being uh, being able to evaluate corneal shape so probably yes i have seen it but i i haven't seen it a lot Yeah, can so, I just for one second? Let's, let's clarify one more point that if you have regression, okay, oh. and uh, and you see post-op, then they say that the thickness of the epithelium is more, and it's actually not in regression. So there are instruments which separate the epithelium and the stroma from each other, and actually you find the stroma beneath is normal, and it's just the thickness of the epithelium which gives an impression of regression. Have you found anything like this because you do a lot of epithelial mapping and you feel that this might be a reality um so i i don't have a good answer is the short answer and the longer answer is that um i've been doing a lot of epithelial mapping unfortunately i've switched positions a couple times in the last 5 years and so i don't have a lot of patients where i have 5 7 and 10 year data on this um my guess is there are cases where it's purely epithelial remodeling and nothing else changing but i just don't have great data to support that that's going to take you know again years of study uh and really preoperative and and postoperative maps 
Thank you. So maybe something uh, I just wanted to add to this is regarding the uh, superior, you know, to steepening. Uh, one thing is that you always have to look for you, the, the the significance of superior versus inferior steepening is very different because inferior steepening you give more importance to even lower levels of steepening, whereas when it's superior, the the cutoffs are higher. So you know you need to have really have much more uh, level of superior steepening for it to actually become significant clinically. The other thing is you can also look for peripheral corneal degenerations when you have this kind of picture, you know, epithelial hypertrophies, peripheral corneal degenerations. These are the things that uh, you kind of suspect because keratoconus has this tendency to kind of, you know, localize itself. And when we see so many keratoconus again and again and again, it has this inferotemporal predilection, which is really, which is really remarkable over thousands of cases. So superior steepening, you need to look, up, look for other conditions, epithelial remodeling and uh, consider those and also uh, with regards to the uh, corneal thickening and uh, when you have some kind of suspicious topographies it <laughs> like brad said it may not be very uh, uh, you know reliable but one thing we also need to keep in mind is that uh, fuchs and keratoconus do have uh, some association that has been uh, you know uh, said to occur so uh, if you have a very suspicious cornea uh, generally, the fugues would mask it, but if you have a very suspicious cornea uh, and you have uh, thickening, please do also consider this and do a specular microscopy, maybe look for gutted changes and things like that. And I also think that it could also uh, be because of the corneal diameter. So because, you know, it's kind of extrapolating it over a certain corneal diameter. So patients with a larger corneal diameter as opposed to a smaller uh, white to white, uh, there would be variations in the pentacam, uh, you know, just because of that also. Yeah, and actually there's a recent study that's either published or soon to be published uh, coming from China showing how particularly some of the metrics that are generated from the particular, this was in the Pentacam, um, but how they look quite different in a, that the population studied had uh, smaller eyes. And, and so it is, it, it's, it's really a factor as well. Absolutely. And that's also the reason why a lot of the Pentacam values are based, uh, the matrices are based on Caucasian eyes. And uh, the data is not as yet, you know, as strong for Indian eyes or for Asian eyes. And sure. that's the reason we also need to get this, uh, this data, you know, stronger so that we are able to apply it to our own, uh, you know, population as well. Yeah, yeah. And in cases of superior steepening, would we avoid any flap-based procedures uh, or, uh, or when do we give the option of flap-based? If there's a slight superior steepening, can we go ahead with the uh, LASIK or do we totally avoid it? I think if you have kind of ruled out uh, ectasia, peripheral corneal degeneration and things like that, then you could go ahead with a, a flap-based procedure also. If it's more than 2.5, I would think twice again, but uh, otherwise you could. To yeah. Brad or Marsa, do you? Uh, yeah, I, I would tend to agree. Again, I, I think there are rare cases where I find that it really tru truly looks like an ectatic cornea. Dr. Kumar, uh, in certain cases where we do not see any significant anterior or posterior elevation on the bag display, but if there is a final D value which comes to be in the borderline and we do not have uh, epithelial thickness mapping and uh, in such cases biomechanical indices like the CBI, TBI uh, would, would definitely be helpful. So what would be the cutoff and uh, uh, what surgeries would you recommend based on the borderline no, values? That's a, that's a damn tough question because if everything else is normal and so I would definitely if the cornea is 500 plus then uh, you know nowadays surface is taking the lead so trans epithelial PRK I'm doing quite a bit of it and results are excellent uh, so I would still if it's a borderline case and everything is not too sure cylindrical is high then the safest bet would be to do a surface and this is what I would do if it is necessary. And surface results nowadays are very good with the trans epithelial I have a marriage win, and the results are very, very good. So that's what my line of action would be. But of course, if it's a straightforward case, all the other indices are fine, then I would still prefer a femto procedure, or I don't have smile yet, I have access to a smile. Otherwise, I would still prefer to do a smile if that is smooth. And now they say that you have to go deeper in the smile. Uh, it's better to go a little deeper than what it used to be done before. Susan will have I guess Susan would have more experience in that to tell us more. And of course, Brad would say that more. I uh, have always been of the opinion that you cannot go by a single value. You know, you really need to take everything into consideration. Uh, so just uh, a plain bad D cannot be taken on its face alone, correlated with everything else. And that's when you can actually reach a decision. So that, that would be my answer to that. Yeah. 
what uh, what are the three indices or parameters to arouse suspicion of ectasia or rather what would be the topographic features that we would see like to detect an early post lasic ectasia uh, dr bright would you like to answer this i'm sorry what would they be for a, to determine if the patient is developing ectasia or to or or to determine if they're at risk uh, developing an ectasia after lasik <clears throat> yeah so uh, the first thing is it, it's it's really helpful to have imaging um at your own place I, i think that you can never image someone too often because you would always anytime someone comes to you you always wish you had an old image to compare difference maps are are definitely the best way to go to see if you're having changes again um most of the time you're going to see some focal steepening uh, if you have epithelial maps you're going to see some focal thinning uh, particularly in a myopic lasik case we expect to see hypertrophy of the epithelium uh, that's just the normal response if you see some thinning in that epithelium then that often means that there's a forward protrusion of the cornea so those are the things that I'm really going to look at uh the posterior elevation changes are still difficult uh to evaluate and the metrics unfortunately are are not really useful at all postoperatively so i would say don't look at you know the enhanced ectasia things all of those are based on preoperative corneas and they're just not going to look they're, they're all going to look abnormal even for normal healthy uh, lasik cases that have been stable for years those metrics are still going to look abnormal so you've really got to look for focal protrusions of the corneal surface um uh, and then again if you have epithelial mapping along with thinning and how often would you repeat the topography after a lasik uh, every yearly or in any case if there is a suspicion Well, I think so any time there's a suspicion certainly, but if you get a baseline image postoperatively when the patient is stable, then that will serve you very well. I don't think that you have to to necessarily get serial images because once you have a postoperative image, then even if 5 years later there's a question, you still have that, you know what they look like right after surgery and you still have that to compare against. So I would say for normal patients that are doing well having one postoperative image is uh, of immense value just in case anything comes up later on. Yeah. One more thing I'd just like to add is that uh, when you look at post lasik ectasia you have to especially if you're not uh, routinely uh, if you're not a refractive surgeon you have to remember that you're not looking for very steep values like you know 48 49 50 to diagnose that because the cornea has been flattened out to start with. so you're going to be having that steepening against those flat values so what you see you might just see you know a 38 or something in the center and a little 42 or something in the periphery and that doesn't make it normal you still have to see the difference and uh, realize that that's a steepening that's actually happening and of course then add it add, add the epithelial map and everything else brad i wanted to ask you about the first case which you actually presented you were saying that there was a fault with the indices is that what i understood correct or I missed out something. Well, I, the indices did not show anything particular. Uh, yeah, so they. Uh, I think that if you were using the just the indices to evaluate that cornea, and, and I mean, so that person did have surgery. So it's likely that somebody was using the indices. They all looked normal, so they proceeded with the case. And then that's a case where that. certainly was not the right approach so was it smile or was it a femto uh that was lasik i don't know if it was a femto lasik or a microkeratoma i'm not sure that was from uh, that was not my case and it was from years ago the so post hyperopic lasik ectasia is um, which is which is not very common but uh, uh you have seen in cases of post hyperopic lasik ectasia sir and how does it actually look on the topography to detect at the early stage Yeah, th- that is more challenging because the hyperopic cornea or the the post hyperopic lasik cornea is focally steeper as well. Um it it's also a little harder um because so one of the markers, you know, again if we go back to years and years ago, 
Um, the marker of irregular astigmatism was not being able to be well corrected with just a manifest refraction, and that's still quite valuable. If you have patients who you can no longer correct to 2020 or whatever their preoperative correction was, uh, then that's uh, concerning. After post-hyperopic LASIK, if the treatment was high enough and or if there's some decentration in the treatment, those patients might have a reduction in acuity from irregular astigmatism, but not progressive irregular astigmatism. So it is more challenging. Um, fortunately, it's also less common. We do less hyperopic treatments and uh, we tend to not thin the cornea in the thinnest regions. Um, but it, it, you know, again, you look at the same things, uh, but it's going to require a higher index of suspicion early on because the cornea will be focally steep and it will be uh, a little bit higher chance of having, say, a decentration. So it's, it's more challenging. So we have another question which says, uh, what is the correlation between epithelial mapping and shine plug imaging to detect early keratoconus? And uh, does one precede the other in early detection? Um, so, I, I don't know. Uh, the last answer, does one precede the other? In theory, um, in theory, possibly. I think, in reality, I think corneal ectasias present in a variety of different ways. Uh, there is some theory that epithelial thickness will be the first thing to change because any curvature change will be compensated by that. I will say that I'm not convinced that that's always correct. Um, the correlation is, again, when you find, uh, for me, if the, if the shine fluke tomography looks completely normal on every surface and every indice and the epithelium uh, looks a little thin, I don't, uh, I, I don't use that in isolation to say, well, there's an abnormality. Um, so I look for correlation. I look for sort of mild steepenings that don't look like keratoconus, but they look a little suspicious, mild elevations, mild focal thinnings, and a thinning on epithelium, or the opposite, where it's some mild findings, but hypertrophy. So I use them together, but I don't really use one as superior to the other. I think, Sanjana, if the question is related to uh, early, uh, very early keratoconus, you know, uh, for picking that up, I think I would probably go by the posterior elevation maps. Uh, give that the most importance because that's where the uh, earliest forms would be picked up. Uh, as, as you come to the more, uh, you know, advanced forms, probably uh, epithelial maps will also start gaining importance. Is that right, Brad? Well, that's a or great a question. That, that, is, um, that is maybe right. And I think there's still a lot more information uh, that we need. What we don't have, you know, unfortunately, we don't have... 10,000 people who were imaged at the age of 15 and then looking back at the age of 25 or 30, that's really what we would need to be able to answer that. Um, I, I do think that probably not every ectatic cornea presents the same way. And so, um, again, I tend to give a little bit more weight based on my experience and research to the anterior surface, but I don't ignore the posterior surface in any way. Um, I think if you find focal posterior elevations, then you need to either um, avoid surgery or be able to answer what's going on. Uh, but again, I think, I think trying to say that one surface versus another is definitive right now is just unfortunately premature. That's what we're still trying to work out. I know, uh, Brad, that you have, uh, uh, in, uh, along with some other authors, uh, you know, got a paper out on uh, the incidence of keratoconus in the pediatric population, Riyadh. Yeah, uh, which it is a very incredibly high. It, it's a, a very it's high, really, high percentage of, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, amazing how high it is. That was, uh, that was really an eye opener for me also to know that the percentage is so high. And uh, I think that's also partly because, uh, uh, you know, uh, the newer, uh, you know, tomographers were used for identifying them. Whereas oh, absolutely. The yep. All, all the previous definitions were with the older, uh, you know, the, the anti surface imaging alone and things like that, or, or with clinical imaging. A clinical uh, decision making and so on and so forth. So I think keratoconus is really much more prevalent than we think it is. And yes. I think, uh, yes. Brad, if you if you if you and the other authors can do a follow up study of these this large pediatric population, we would have the yeah. answer to that. Epithelial that mapping. Would 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's very true. That's very well, and that's the that's part of what's called the K map study, and and that's really trying to be done in a variety of different regions. And again, it'll be a long time before we have great data, but we're getting more and more at least prevalence data around the globe. So it's it's very helpful. And ma'am, how do we differentiate the, on the topography map the post-LASIK ectasia or the decentered ablation? Um, well, so, uh, oh, yeah, in a myopic treatment, they really aren't uh, they really aren't particularly similar. Um, in a hyperopic treatment, they can be a little bit more challenging. Um, but again, the the decentration is for the most part only going to show up on the anterior surface, whereas uh, an ectasia is going to show up on every surface. Yeah. Would you like to add anything to this? No, I think uh, that's uh, that's perfectly fine. And also the importance of, like Brad said, uh, you know, having some more maps uh, available post-operatively. So ectasia would not show up so soon. So you would know whether you're dealing with a decentration or with an ectasia. Uh, if you have, let's say, at one month or two months, or maybe it's refractive stability at three months, and you have a, a, a picture, a, a shine plug imaging done at that point of time, that would make a lot of difference. Decentration, of course, is also not going to be progressive. It's going to be stable and remain like that. Whereas in connective, going to uh, you know keep on having changes, refractive changes, and tomographic changes, and uh, those are the things that would kind of uh, help you uh, figure out. And yeah, uh, I think is more relative to maps may also be important for this uh, again in ectasia you would have thinning over the ectatic portion in decentration you may not expect that would be a more uniform so there are ways in which you could make this out sir um, dr kumar sir something you uh, wanted to add i just said that decentration is again more relative to the pupil so you have to look at the pupil and then you can make out that the treatment is decentered so you can yeah. make out that the patient is unhappy with quality of vision Cases of uh, significant anterior and posterior elevation. Uh, so, do you still go ahead with the cornea-based procedures combining with the uh, cross-linking? Uh, what's your opinion on that, sir? Or do you avoid cornea-based procedures? Uh, so, that's a great question, and I will say I, I don't think we have much of an answer on how um, on how relatively stronger a cornea is after a combined procedure. So I don't do combined procedures for purely refractive cases or outcomes uh, at this time. I am doing combined procedures occasionally for patients with known ectasia where I am trying to stabilize the cornea first and reduce, usually reduce astigmatism, uh, a reduce but not treat. Um, in my hand, if I was concerned enough about the corneal findings that I didn't want to do laser vision correction alone, then I would avoid laser correction. Uh, that, that's, that's my stand. So in this relation, I would have one question for you that uh, you get a patient today who walks into your center and says, uh, and you feel it's suspicious, okay? Mm -hmm. A 22-year-old person, you feel suspicious and comes to you for refractive surgery and you say that let's not have refractive surgery for this because of so many reasons. Uh, you would have this regularly for so many years to come. How many of them have actually gone into an ectasia naturally without you doing anything? Yeah, well, that's so, a good question. I said, you know, I'd, a little weird question, but I just thought of that. No, it's a, it's a perfect question. And what we need are for those people to come back to see you in five years and 10 years. And that, you know, just a lot of times when you've said no to surgery, they don't come back. So we haven't seen them, but but certainly some of them do. You know, there's no question. Yeah, I think also uh, if you have uh, any suspicion of keratoconus, I personally would not uh, go in for a corneal based refractive surgery, even if it's an extra. Now, if you're just having some, you know, thin cornea with no other uh, things like that, that is where I think most people would also do. I'm not a big fan of uh, extras. I know uh, we are doing some. Uh, I personally haven't done too many, but. Uh, but uh, I would definitely not do it where you are actually suspecting keratoconus. Yep. It's for non-keratoconic thinner corneas that I would, uh, or, or something like that, where I would uh, uh, maybe support it, but not, not for keratoconic patients. Yeah. This would be a question this, yeah, and Brad, uh, would be that if you have, what's your cutoff for surface treatment? Like in India, they say legally the cutoff is 480. So what's the cutoff? Is there anything legal about this value of a cutoff? For the surface treatment? 
what I've found in talking to people is the uh, that is the most regional <laughs> regional thing I've seen where. Uh, some areas have cutoffs in terms of thickness. Some, some areas have cutoffs in terms of how high they'll do treatments. Uh, there's nothing in the United States specifically, and I've certainly treated corneas much thinner than that. Um, so I, I don't personally feel that there's a specific cutoff, but I do think that once you start getting a very thin cornea, you have to really look at all of the other findings to make sure that you don't think that it's a thin, suspicious cornea. And what would be the RST that you would keep uh, for a surface ablation or LASIK? Uh, is it any difference or you would keep the same around 280 or 300? Some people would prefer 300. Some people prefer 280. So what's your opinion on that, sir? I generally try to prefer about 300. I don't tend to differentiate between LASIK and, uh, and PRK in terms of that. Yeah, uh, it's the same here. I also try and keep 300 uh, for, uh, yeah, for, for both of them. In fact, PRK, we also do not do it at very high powers because of the greater incidence of haze. I, I don't know whether uh, there's also a limitation, a spare component of machine, uh, you know, there uh, as well, you know, about uh, the, the type of ablation that you're doing, which ends up in you having haze. But uh, uh, very high powers definitely uh, going for, a, not, not for a surface ablation. Yeah. I think also the UV, the increased UV exposure that we have in India may also, you know, give a contribution to the amount of haze. Uh, Kumar, sir, do you have to add anything to that? So, uh, Brad, again, a question to you would be uh, about the percentile calculation we all follow, right? There was a recent study published, I think, from Korea, where they did one eye, they followed a percentile calculation, and the other eye, they did not follow a percentile calculation. What is your thought from this? Is it then we have to follow up percentile calculation. Sometimes, you know, in the percentile calculation came about 10, 12 years back. And if you've been doing refractive surgery since 20 years, we did not have percentile calculation. So what's your thought on this as a latest that should we follow this as a rule, as a norm? Is it a legal requirement? Is it scientifically perfect? What's your thought on that? And Susan, you also can answer this. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, answering sort of backwards, I, I don't think that it is validated to the extent that it should be a legal requirement. Um, I, I don't think so. I think it is a good concept to understand. Um, as with all of these things that are continuous variables, I mean, I, I, we're taking every one of the things that we're looking at as a continuous variable between the percent thickness altered, the residual stromal bed, cutoffs for keratometry, all of these are things are continuous. And when you start to put artificial boundaries around those, you know, is there something different between 300 microns of residual stromal bed and 294 microns? I think logically, nobody thinks that those six microns are doing all the work. So when you think about it, logically, cutoffs don't really make sense. We use them to give you a general idea. Um, I think PTA is a good thing to think about, but I don't have specific numbers in mind, and I certainly don't think it should be a legal, uh, I don't think that it should be a legal document or, or, or doctrine. So you follow and PTA in all your cases for LASIK? Uh, so I don't, I, I can't say that I follow it specifically, no. I, I look at it. I, I look at it among all other factors, but no, I don't, I, I don't have, a, again, I don't say, oh, well, this is 39, they're okay, but 40, I'm concerned. I just don't do that. I look to see how much do we look like we're going to be altering this cornea. Susan, yeah. you're okay. Yeah, PT, I think Marconi has done a lot of work on this and he's uh, given some great, uh, you know, uh, data regarding uh, PTA and its importance uh, with relations to the amount of ablation you perform and whether it's going to result in any uh, significant weakening of the cornea. Uh, there's also some work by Elaine Saad uh, who, you know, has said that uh, person, uh, PTV, which is basically volume, percentage of tissue, uh, the volume of tissue that's ablated, right. is also another factor that you need to look at more than PTA as well. So, there are a lot of thoughts on this and there's a lot of, uh, you know, studies going around on all this. And as you said, these are patients who develop ectasia and you really, it's very difficult to get ectatic patients out and do a large scale study on this. And that's the weakness of most of these studies because it's difficult to get a large number of ectatic patients and backtrack the data and find out. So, uh, so yeah, but uh, obviously if you're going into very, uh, you know, high values, then you're definitely, the, you need to be careful about. But uh, uh, these are things to think about, whether it's percentage tissue ablation, percentage tissue volume, 
uh, and I think there are going to be further studies, obviously, as everything in ophthalmology, which is going to validate uh, these these uh, values more and more. Yeah. And in cases of uh, one eye keratoconus and the other eye form frustrate keratoconus, uh, do we go ahead with cross-linking them immediately or do we wait? You asking me? Well, so uh, to me, it depends on the patient age. If the patient is young, I do. Um, if the patient, so if the patient is less than say, and, and again, not an exact number, but less than 21, 22, um, if the patient more recently has noticed changes in their vision, whereas they didn't know they had disease before, then I'm more likely to do it sort of right away. If someone comes in in their 30s and they have findings in one eye and are just suspicious in the other eye, I'll watch that. Um, if I'm not going to treat, though, I want to watch very closely. I want to watch every about three months at the beginning to make sure that there's really no change. Uh, below, say, 18 years of age, I'm going to treat both eyes, um, almost always. So, but, you know, again, with, never with exact cutoffs, but in general, that's kind of my approach. What's yeah. your opinion on this one? And uh, I, I would add to that uh, history of eye rubbing, things like that. All that would add and, uh, you know, uh, make you think more in terms of prospecting. The other important thing in continuation with what Brad just said is, uh, I always hear, uh, see a lot of discussion, you know, uh, about pediatric keratoconus. And just because you said young, younger age, uh, that's something that I would like to say is, uh, you know, there are discussions which I see happening in groups where, you know, people want to wait and see progression uh, documented in a pediatric keratoconus before you actually cross link. And what I'd like to say is really in pediatric keratoconus, it's so aggressive. The type of keratoconus there is uh, much more aggressive than when you see it as a late onset. And it's logical to th understand that. It's happened at a young age. Uh, that means it's going to be a more aggressive disease. Obviously, the person was not born with that kind of keratoconus, uh, that kind of uh, topography. So it has progressed. If you're seeing it at that age, it has progressed. There's no need to document progression in that. Right. And so right. uh, you, you need to cross-link immediately. You don't want to wait for uh, you know, documenting progression because by the time the patient comes back, sometimes it's progressed dramatically. Yep. And sometimes you lose the patient to follow up. The parents may not come. And these are bad things that happen. And uh, you see these patients come at very late stage keratoconus and often even, uh, you know, requiring a DALC or something like that. So when you see a pediatric keratoconus, please cross link immediately. Yeah. Man? And also, you would like to add anything? Uh, just one more thing, sorry. We also have to be kept on follow up much more frequently than adults because, again, uh, the baseline, uh, for, you know, strength that you started off with is so much lower. And also there's called constant collagen remodeling happening. So you have to keep them and follow up to keep uh, a watch on whether you need to cross link them again or not. Uh, Dr. Kumar, uh, you would like to add anything to this? Uh, no, I think that's perfect. I, I, think, I think you have to watch the kids very closely. Uh, we have one more, uh, probably we'll be winding up soon. So we have one more question. How is ABCD classification reliable to detect keratoconus? Dr. Bright, would you like to comment? Uh, sure. So um, with any of these metrics, so the ABCD, um, I think, is very good at helping to document progression. Um, because it gives you a broader view of, uh, of the eye than a single metric. And we, we know that single metrics are a little, um, are, are potentially highly variable. So I think for documenting progression, it is quite useful. For diagnosing at the very beginning stage for keratoconus, I'm not sure that it's that much more useful uh, than your clinical assessment of all of the different uh, maps and indices. I think it's helpful, but not, um, not absolute to detect. But I think for progression, quite helpful. Uh, and in cases of uh, keratoconus, uh, what indices exactly do you look at to say that it's a definite progression? So, uh, Is that for me? Oh, for all the panelists. OK. <laughs> Right, you're the, you're, the, you're the chief person here, so you go. Well, I just, I, I try not to talk over everybody, so. Um, yeah, so again, I, I think that, um, I, I, I think, you know, again, we do certainly look at K-Max. Um, I want to look at the location. Um, I don't want to look at just the value. I want to look at difference maps. For me, difference maps are, 
are by far and away the best thing. And, and you can look at changes in everything. You can look at changes in the anterior curvature. You can look at changes in the anterior and posterior elevation, changes in thickness. To me, I think that thickness is, is the least predictive um, and probably because there's a lot of remodeling going on at all different times. So I, for me, it's, it's going to be shape uh, more than thickness. Um, and, and then again, I think that the ABCD classifications when you have multiple measurements are quite helpful. Yeah, I agree. It's mostly for progression uh, because you have these vertical bars, you know, these bar charts that come and you can actually plot it uh, a long time, uh, including you can even feel in the distance visual acuity and see how that is plotting mid time. So that's uh, that's uh, a good thing that you can do. And uh, was there any an, an addition question with that or was that the only question? Just that's it. That's it now. Yeah, the other thing about what uh, Brad said about pachymetry in continuation with that, Especially post cross linking, you know, your pachymetric evaluation, you cannot base your progression, uh, you know, depending on just the pachymetry alone because it's completely unreliable after that. Uh, yes. So that's, yeah, so that's, that's really important to know. So I think uh, we'll be winding up this session. Uh, before we wind up the session, I would like to ask one last question to Dr. Bright. Uh, could you please tell us about the Brillin microscopy and how it would actually help us in detecting the form for stachyotoconus? Yeah, so uh, incredibly exciting. We're, we're right in the middle of the work. Um, I, I'm extremely excited about it. I don't want to pretend that this is the perfect answer and the only answer, but um, the reason that I'm particularly excited about this is, is, is the following. So Brillon basically, um, uh, at a level of physics that I'm not equipped to answer for you, but essentially it looks at the natural uh, shift in light that is coming into and out of a structure, or in this case, corneal tissue. Um, and that shift can show you the relative stiffness of tissue in the Z direction as well as the X, Y. So um, one thing is we don't have to perturb the cornea in any way. We don't need to touch the cornea. We don't need to sh uh, push an air puff or do anything that, is, that adds variability to the measurements. Uh, the second thing is that we can see, we can really uh, separate the, say, the anterior third of the cornea from the middle third and the posterior third. And, um, you know, there's a reasonable amount of evidence that most of the initial changes in terms of structurally and maybe biomechanically are actually in the anterior portion of the cornea because that's the region that's typically the stiffest in a normal cornea. So we can really separate that out from a total cornea. And, and this, this can potentially have advantages over the devices that we have right now because, for instance, the Corvus requires an air puff uh, the ORA, the same type of air puff. And what it can give you is a total corneal uh, evaluation, whereas what we think is in early disease states, the overall cornea is not going to be that dramatically different. It's probably going to be a small section of the cornea that is involved early. And we're hoping that we can detect that uh, really focally. And that, so, so that's why uh, I'm particularly excited about this. And Maybe I can just add one more thing. Brad also published a paper on uh, my something that's very close to me, CACXL and Brillon microscopy. And yeah. uh, basically that said uh, what we had also been saying, that it gives you about 70% effect of uh, the standard cross-linking. So yep. uh, that was a very good validation of what we've done. And we are also now working on uh, using, along with uh, Alan Menconi from uh, South America, working on using higher, uh, you know, oxygen transmissibility contact lenses and seeing how we can, you know, further strengthen the amount of cross-linking that happens with the CACXL as well. So that's a yeah. work in progress and uh, we've just started that. Yeah. Brad, what what does what effect does hydration have on uh, blown microscopy? There was something it I just a, wanted. Yeah, it has a dramatic effect. Um, we published a paper recently, again, uh, uh, all, all of the science of this is really drawn uh, driven by Giuliano Scarcelli. Uh, he and Andy Yoon sort of co-invented this for the cornea. Um, but we, we published a study really out of Giuliano's lab um, uh, over the past few months that uh, they were able to really separate out in the lab the difference between hydration 
and corneal orientation. And so, so that's really giving us confidence. The particular issue with Berlan is in laboratory studies because it's hard to control uh, hydration variation. In living animals and, and, and humans, um, you know, we anticipate that those things will normalize over time. And so it's a little bit less susceptible, but laboratory studies are much more susceptible to hydration. And we've really got a, a good mechanism to be able to separate those, those, uh, those outcomes now. All right. But this uh, corneal ectasia and all is such an interesting topic that we can go on for a long time. Uh, so <laughs> we have had a very interactive session. I thank you all the panelists. I thank you, Dr. Brad, Susan, ma'am, and Dr. Kumar, sir, for joining us and taking your time off. And uh, for all the online viewers who have missed this, please do watch it on our YouTube channel. It goes with the name Dr. Agarwal's Clinical Education. I'm sure it will be of great help. I would like to thank you all once again for this session. And thank, thank you, you Ashwin, sir, for organizing this. Hi, Susan. See you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. Brad. Thank Bye. Thank you. Thank you for moderating beautifully. <laughs>